Welcome everyone to the uh, Planetary Fluid Dynamics Seminar. Um, next time in two weeks, we'll have our last uh, talk of the season before we take a break for the summer. And uh, that will be uh, Mara Freilich from Scripps talking about something you don't get on every planet, which is uh, ecology in ocean turbulence. Uh, it's in two weeks. And this week we have Daphne Lamasquier, Daphne Lamasquier, hope I said that all right, who is currently a postdoc at University of Texas, Austin. She got her PhD from Ex Marseille University in uh, 2021. And I just found out will shortly be taking a faculty position at St. Andrews in Scotland. So with that, welcome Daphne, and uh, we're glad to have you. That's a great group in Scotland. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited. Thank but you very so much. They're so numerical. Like... They're so numerical. Can you get them away from their computers? Yeah, may, I'll, I'll try. I'll see if I can set up a lab in Dundee, like work in collaboration with Dundee to set up a lab. And yeah, we'll see. I'm really excited. Okay, Great. so let me share my screen. Uh, I just want to have. Do you see my mouse? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. I just want to move this away. <laughs> Okay, so don't hesitate to interrupt me if I if you have any questions during the talk. I'm glad to to be interrupted. Um, so thank you for this introduction, Jonathan. I'm really very excited to give this talk in this uh, very nice seminar series. So today, uh, as Jonathan said, I'm working at the the University of Texas at Austin, but I wanted to present you the work that I did in uh, in Marseille, in France, for my PhD regarding the the dynamics of of Jupiter. So Jupiter, uh, we had a couple of talks uh, detailing the Jupiter's dynamics and stuff, but I just wanted to do a, a brief introduction again. So it's a gas giant planet. Uh, it's massive. It's twice as massive as all of the, the other planets in the solar system combined. And it exhibits a very interesting fluid dynamics that we can really see in the, in the visible, uh, as you can see on this, uh, on this picture. So we can uh, better appreciate these dynamics by looking at this uh, this footage, which was taken by the Cassini probe of several uh, several Jovian days, and you can see that it's a very turbulent flow, very chaotic flow, but it's dominated by large scale features, including uh, the famous Great Red Spot and uh, smaller ovals, which are all anti cyclones here. And we also have very fast winds, which are called zonal winds or zonal jets and which are responsible for the bended structure of, uh, of Jupiter. So these winds can reach velocities up to several hundreds of, of kilometers per hour, and they are extremely stable since we observe them on, the, on Jupiter. So this is the mid-latitude picture of Jupiter's dynamics, which is known since, uh, since quite a long time. And I just wanted to mention that uh, very exciting results came uh, about the polar regions thanks to the recent Juno mission, including the fact that we, we observe some circumpolar uh, cyclones organized into, into polygonal clusters. So I'm not going to, to talk about that today, but I just wanted to say that now we also have a lot of work to do regarding the, the polar regions of this gas giant. So that's the picture for the um, what we see like uh, at the surface uh, in the cloud layer of Jupiter. Now, thanks to indirect measurements and inverse model, we also have clues on what happens. What? How is the the planet structured in its interior? Uh, sorry, did you hear that? No. Okay, it's not a big deal. Um, so the planet we know it's mainly composed of helium and hydrogen. Uh, which are gaseous in an outer envelope, which is called the weather layer. Uh, then the hydrogen is going to become liquid at depth, and presumably the helium separates from the hydrogen. And deeper still, the hydrogen is metallic, and there's uh, some perhaps a diluted core composed of heavy elements. So it's still a kind of unknown, a uh, lot of unknowns regarding Jupiter's interior, but there are two important things that I just wanted to underline. Uh, here, uh, the first one is that it's a, really a fluid ball. Uh, so the fact that there's there are no sharp boundaries between any of these layers, so it's really a fluid continuum. And so, contrary to the Earth, where we have like the atmosphere, which uh, is uh, anchored onto a solid surface, so it's it's a really different different kind of uh, of fluid dynamics. And the second important point is that 
all of what we see is the advection of the clouds of ammonia, ammonium hydrosulfide, or water ice, which are located in, in, the, in the cloud layer of Jupiter. So presumably, all the dynamics that we see is not 2D, but it's a three-dimensional dynamics. And one of the big questions, of course, is to know how does this dynamics behave? What does it become at depth in the inside of Jupiter? Okay, so for instance, I just wanted to, to give the big picture with the recent Juno mission. We know that the picture right now is more that the vortices, the large scale vortices that we see are rather shallow structures of about 100 kilometers thick contained in the weather layer. Whereas the zonal jets are uh, presumably very deep structures, which, which extend several thousands of kilometers deep in Jupiter. So I've listed here some key questions that we can address uh, when, we, when we observe that kind of dynamics. So for instance, for mid-latitude vertices, we can wonder how do they form, why they're so long-lived, how do they couple with the zonal jets, and what is their depth uh, in, the, in Jupiter? Uh, for the zonal jets, we have the same kind of very basic fluid di dynamics questions. How do they form? Uh, what, how are they dissipated at depth? And what factors are going to control their intensity and scale? And also, of course, what is the feedback between these very large scale structures and the underlying turbulence? And for the polar dynamics, even if, of course, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it right now, there's a bunch of new questions regarding how to explain the transition between jet dominating regime at low latitudes and a vortices dominated regime at high latitudes. Why do we see a majority of cyclones and why do, how do they self-organize into those beautiful clusters? So to answer these kind of questions, of course, we have a different method. Um, we can use direct observation and inverse, try to inverse them to get uh, information about the flow and the physics. We can also perform some global scale modeling and try to reproduce as much physics as possible in, in direct numerical simulations and see, see what happens. But you, generally, the simulations are extremely costly. And the last kind of approach is, is to isolate some key processes occurring in the, in the atmosphere and try to model them from an idealized uh, perspective. So that's the, I'm going to, to follow this last approach in the, in the, in the talk, and that's what I did during my PhD. But of course, uh, all of those methods are, are complementary, and it's very nice to go back and forth. And the last point is that, so before, before getting into more detail, I wanted to say that, of course, uh, the, the processes that we're going to look at and the results I'm going to show are presumably you can extend them or apply them to other planetary fluid layers, such as the other gas giant Saturn, the Earth atmosphere, where we also have some nice uh, jet streams, uh, the Earth ocean, where zonal jets are also uh, have also been observed, or even liquid outer cores of terrestrial planets, where you have the same kind of uh, physical effects that are present. So for this talk, I'm going first to present you a first study that uh, that we did, uh, yeah, maybe two or three years ago now, regarding the depth of uh, mid-latitude Jovian anticyclones. And then I'm going to present you a second study in a second part regarding the emergence of zonal jets in a, in a laboratory setup. So let me start first with uh, mid-latitude Jovian anticyclones. Uh, so, of course, what I'm going to present is not uh, only my PhD work, it's the results of uh, work that was starting a long ago that involved a couple of people uh, from, so in including uh, Phil Marcus from Berkeley, my PhD supervisors, Benjamin Michael yeah, at IRFE, Patrice, who is at IRFE too, Pedram Hazenzade uh, in Houston, and Julio, who was uh, PhD at IRFE too, but who's not now in Brussels. So the depth, the question of the depth of uh, Jovian anticyclones arise because at least up to recently, we had no, we had no direct measurements of how deep uh, those vortices were. And so for instance, uh, Hyde proposed in 1961 that maybe the great red spot is the Taylor column and extends deep into Jupiter's interior up to an unknown solid surface uh, at depth. 
So of course, now we know that there's no solid surface uh, and these vortices are rather modeled as floating structures contained in the weather layer of Jupiter. However, uh, up to the Juno measurements, we could not directly really test this hypothesis and measure the vertical structures of those vortices. So one idea is that we could try to seek for analogous structures in the ocean where we have actual uh, measurements. And uh, we could say, for instance, that uh, the floating vortices in Jupiter's atmosphere could be analogous to the medis that uh, evolve in our uh, Earth oceans. So Medi is a contraction of Mediterranean eddies. So eddies that originate from the Mediterranean Sea, which add flows through the Strait of Gibraltar and detach at, at its uh, isodensity level. So this water is uh, warmer and saltier than the Atlantic Ocean water. And when it detaches, it forms an anticyclone, a pocket of uh, water rotating in the anticyclonic direction. And you can see on this uh, salinity profile of the Medi that it's a very compact structure, really floating in the stratification with a kind of ellipsoidal shape, which is about 100 times uh, thinner than white. Uh, so the idea is that, okay, we have those measurements, maybe we can try to predict what should be the, sh the equilibrium shape of these structures, and we can try then to apply that and use this prediction to predict the depth of uh, Jovian anticyclones. So to predict this shape, we first need to identify the key physical ingredients that are responsible for this shape. So of course, the first one is rotation, the rotation of the planet. So if you inject a dye in a rotating tank, the effect of rotation is that you're going to generate a vortex, but it's going to homogenize along the rotation axis following the, the Taylor-Prudman theorem. So we're going to obtain a columnar vortex. Now we know that the second important ingredient in the weather layer of Jupiter is stratification. Uh, the weather layer is weakly stratified. So in that case, if you inject a dye in stratified in the stratified tank, which is not rotating, is going to spread horizontally because, of course, the stratification impedes the motion along the, the density gradient. And then if you imagine that you have both rotation and stratification, when you do the same experiments, you inject dye in a rotating stratified flow, well, it's going to take an equilibrium shape, which is an ellipsoid, neither a column nor flat. It's just this, uh, this equilibrium shape. So we have these two ingredients. And finally, we are going to add a third uh, ingredient, which is the shear, which is imposed by the zonal winds uh, around the, the vortices. So we're going to build an experiment where we can add the three ingredients together. So basically, we're going to use a square tank. This tank, we're going to uh, fill it with water stratified in density using salt. You have the stratification uh, uh, profile here. And uh, we're going to rotate this tank at a rate omega. So in the following, I'm going to denote N, the, the buoyancy frequency, and F, the Coriolis frequency associated with the rotation. And on top of that, we're going to add inside of this tank a shearing device, which is made of a membrane that rotates around two vertically aligned cylinders. And we're going to denote sigma, the linear uh, shear rate that is imposed by this, uh, by this device. Uh, then we're going to use a capillary tube and inject a homogeneous fluid at mid-depth in the shearing device. And so owing to the geostrophic equilibrium, following this injection, we're going to form an anticyclone. And because the fluid is stratified, uh, of course, as I said earlier, this anticyclone is going to be confined vertically. Then the goal is that we want to follow both uh, the strength and the shape of our anticyclone through time. So to do so on a horizontal plane, we're going to use particle image velocimetry. So we're going to seed the fluid with uh, reflective particles. And by following their displacement, we'll be able to reconstruct velocity fields. And on a horizontal plane, we are a uh, vertical plane, sorry, we are going to add a rhodomine B, which is a fluorescent dye, uh, and a vertical laser plane such that we can follow the evolution of the shape of the vortex through time. 
on the vertical direction. Okay, and finally, we are going to complement all of these uh, experimental measurements with direct numerical simulations using NEC 5000. Uh, and uh, the goal of these simulations is really to reproduce exactly the experimental conditions and to be able to compare and strengthen the, the experimental results. So on the left here, you have uh, the rotating table, the principal rotating uh, tank that was used where in which we perform, in which we create the linear uh, density uh, stratification. And on the right here, you see a kind of old movie that was performed by Oriane Aubert, where you can see the tank rotating with the laser sheet in the middle. And uh, the bright spot here is the anticyclone, which contains the, the fluorescent dye. And uh, as I said earlier, so in that movie, there was no shimmering device. What we did is that we added the shimmering device uh, here inside of the principal tank to impose a shear, a linear shear on the vortex. Okay, uh, so now we have these experimental numerical uh, measurements. And uh, the goal now is to derive a model to try to predict the shape of this vortex knowing the ambient parameters of the, of the system. So we're going to make a few assumptions, of course. The first one is that we're going to assume that this vortex is a triaxial ellipsoid of semi-axis A, B, and C. In the following, beta is going to be the equatorial ellipticity of the vortex. So basically, beta is zero if the vortex is a spheroid. And uh, we're going to assume that it has a uniform vorticity omega C in its core. And we're going to define uh, the Rosby number associated with this uh, vorticity. And uh, with this uh, configuration, you can write, for instance, the velocity field in the equatorial plane of the vortex as the following. So we have this uh, model for the vortex, uh, velocity in the vortex. And furthermore, we're going to assume that it is linearly stratified in its core with a buoyancy frequency, uh, which we're going to denote nc in the following, whereas n is the ambient buoyancy frequency. Then we're going to assume that this vortex is in quasi-static equilibrium at any time. And we're going to neglect salt and viscous diffusion. So very simple model, because then we're just, we're just going to end up with the cyclogeostrophic balance on the horizontal direction and hydrostatic balance on the vertical. And so if you inject the velocity field in the vortex uh, in these uh, balances, you're going to end up, uh, you are going to be able to determine the pressure field inside the vortex and in the ambient. And you can then require the pressure field to be continuous between the vortex and the ambient rotating shear flow. And if you require this pressure continuity, you're going to end up with an ellipsoid equation uh, that I uh, represented here. And from this ellipsoid equation, of course, you can extract a low, which is going to give you the horizontal ellipticity of the vortex, and the low, which can give you the vertical aspect ratio of the vortex. Um, so if we take a look at the horizontal ellipticity, for instance, you can see that it's going to depend on the ratio of the vortex strength to the shear, uh, which is uh, kind of intuitive. And for the vertical aspect ratio, C over A, you see that it furthermore involves the difference of the stratification between the vortex and the ambient. Okay, so we have these two lows for the horizontal and vertical shape of this, uh, of this vortex. And now we're going to confront them with our measurements. So uh, first thing that I'm going to show is the evolution of the horizontal aspect ratio, A over B, as a function of uh, basically the strength of the vortex normalized by the shear uh, for five different experiments with increasing shear rate. So the line, the continuous line is the theoretical prediction. The, di the, di the diamonds are the experimental measurements thanks to the PIV. And the dots are the DNS results, the numerical results. So you can see that uh, at any time during uh, these five experiments, there's a pretty good agreement between uh, the, our theoretical prediction and what we, what we measure, both experimentally and numerically. Then the second step is to do the same for the, uh, in the vertical direction. So here I plot 
the vertical aspect ratio, which is measured as a function of the theoretical one, which is predicted using uh, the low I showed before. So the one by one line, again, is going to be the theory. The dots are the DNS results. You see a perfect agreement with this uh, theoretical prediction. And the diamonds are experimental measurements. So we have less experimental measurements in the vertical direction because we need to switch back and forth between the horizontal and the vertical laser sheet. So you see that there's also a good agreement with the experimental measurements, but nevertheless, we see that the theoretical prediction seems to overestimate uh, the aspect ratio, the vertical aspect ratio. And we think that this may be due to the fact that experimentally, uh, we cannot measure the stratification inside of the vortex, NC. So we assume that the vortex is well mixed to compute this, this uh, theoretical aspect ratio, whereas uh, it's probably stratified and evolving through time. So this can explain this, uh, this discrepancy. Um, okay, so now that we have uh, confidence that we, we our uh, theoretical laws uh, agree with uh, our experimental and numerical measurements, we can try to quickly see what it would imply for uh, Jovian vortices. So of course, we need to have estimates of the different uh, parameters uh, for rotation, stratification, speed of the vortices on Jupiter. And uh, once we have estimated all those parameters, we can first uh, try to predict using our lows what should be the horizontal aspect ratio of those vertices. So I've done it for uh, the great red spot in 1979, the oval BA and the oval DE and BC. Um, so here, the continuous line represents what is measured, the horizontal aspect ratio that is measured uh, at the cloud level. And the dashed line represents what is predicted by our uh, theoretical lows. So you can see that we, we do pretty good in predicting what is the horizontal shape, what should be the horizontal aspect ratio of those vertices. Now that's just a check because we can actually measure it. What's more interesting is what happening, what, what it means uh, on the vertical direction. So again, if I use uh, Jovian uh, parameters estimate, Using our model, we can predict that the half height of the great red spot should be of around 80 kilometers and about 50 kilometers for the more uh, moderate ovals, the more moderate anticyclones. So this means that uh, this confirms the fact that those vortices are very shallow structures because this total thickness of between 100 and 200 kilometers is very small compared to their width, which is of several thousands of, of kilometers. So they are very lenticular vortices in the weather layer of, of Jupiter. And finally, I want to say that we can try to go a little bit further. Uh, for the great red spot, we can try to see what our theoretical lows would give for the recent evolution of the great red spot. So we know that the great red spot is shrinking uh, longitudinally, uh, as you can see on, this, uh, on these images. And uh, here in the middle plot, I represented the decrease, the measured decrease of uh, the horizontal aspect ratio of the great red spot as a function of time. So the measured decrease is the white, are the white dots, sorry. And uh, using measurements of velocities inside of the great red spot, we can apply our model and try to predict the decrease of the aspect ratio, and these are the blue dots. So you can see that knowing the evolution of the winds in the great red spot would predict the correct amount of decrease in, in its horizontal aspect ratio. And again, if we switch now to the vertical direction, which is more interesting, we, we obtain that despite this shrinkage, uh, this is not enough to significantly perturb the total uh, vertical extent of the great red spot, which has probably remained roughly constant during this whole, this whole evolution. Okay, so if you're interested in two more details about this study, I've just listed the, the papers associated with it, uh, including our, so if you're more interested about the Jovian application, our last nature physics paper, but otherwise we also have journal of fluid mechanics paper, which describe in more detail the, the associated fluid mechanics. 
And finally, I wanted to conclude that part by quickly commenting on the latest Juno results, where we finally had uh, vertical measurements of the, at least the anomaly, the thermal uh, anomaly associated with the with these, those vertices. So, for instance, these represent results from the microwave radiometer measurements for the great red spot and, and a smaller anticyclone and cyclone. And using these measurements, you can see that the anomaly associated with those vertices can be uh, imaged and follow at depth. And so here I've superimposed the results that I showed you before regarding the total thickness of the great red spot and the smaller ovals. And you can see that we obtain roughly the good order of magnitude compared to, to what was measured, what was uh, deduced from these uh, Juno microwave radiometer measurements. Knowing that here, what we give is like the extent of the vortex, the extent of the winds of the of the vortex, whereas here, uh, what the Juno measurements give is rather the density anomaly associated with those uh, with those vortices, which are two different things. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say regarding the the first part regarding uh, Jovian anticyclones. And now I'm going to switch to the second part of my talk regarding a laboratory model of zonal jets. So again, um, this uh, this project uh, was started before before I started my PhD, namely by John Onu at UCLA and Simon Caban, who was a postdoc at IRFE before I started my PhD, and of course my supervisors, Benjamin and Ken. Um, okay, so like before, uh, like for the vortices, we are first going to start by seeking what are the fundamental ingredients that we need in the system in our experiments to reproduce zonal flows. So the first one, uh, so here on the left, I reproduced, I, I, I drew a schematic of, let's say, a vertical cross section of Jupiter with the zonal winds extending parallel to the rotation axis. And uh, the first ingredient that we need is going to be like before the rotation. So, again, the effect of the rotation is to constrain the flow along the rotation axis. And uh, regarding the turbulence perspective, what's interesting is that if you homogenize the flow along the rotation axis, you're going to end up with a quasi-bidimensional flow because it's going to behave the same at every vertical level, basically. And uh, in terms of the turbulence, it means that instead of having a forward cascade of energy from the forcing uh, scale, we're going to have an inverse cascade of energy from uh, the forcing scale up to a large scale, which could be, for instance, the, the scale of the jets or the scale of the, of the vortices. Then, uh, besides rotation and quasi-bidimensionality, we need a beta effect. So the beta effect can be understood as a topographic effect. So basically, if you imagine a fluid column in this uh, spherical shell with a vorticity zeta, uh, you can describe, you can understand the beta effect by the conservation of uh, potential vorticity. So basically, if you move that column towards the north, it's going to be squeezed, and so its vorticity is going to decrease. Whereas if you move it towards the south, it's going to be stretched, and so its vorticity is going to increase. And so you can understand the beta effect as uh, being due to this, as representing those vorticity changes due to fluid height uh, variations with cylindrical radius. So we can express the beta parameter as depending on the slope of uh, the fluid height, h. And uh, what is important to, there are two important consequences for the, the presence of the beta effects. The first one is that it's going to introduce a new type of waves, which are called Rossby waves, propagating westward. And the second important consequence is that it's going to uh, make the turbulence anisotropic. So if you compare here at the top turbulence without 2D turbulence without a beta effect, and at the bottom turbulence with a beta effect, you can see that in the presence of a beta effect, you have a, a very nice zonation in the east-west directions that is going to develop. So the beta effect is really the important parameter for the for the emergence of the zonal circulation. And at this point, I just wanted to define two scales, the transitional scale, which is basically the smallest scale 
at which at which turbulent eddies are going to be affected by the by the beta effect and the Rhine scale, which you can uh, think of the large scale of the equilibration of the jets, of the zonal jets. So rotation, beta effect, and third ingredient is the presence of a uh, forcing mechanism that is going to inject energy into this fluid layer. So in the planetary uh, system, it's probably a combination of weather layer processes uh, involving, for instance, moist convection and uh, baroclinic instabilities, but it can also be due to deep uh, thermal convection in the interior of Jupiter. So it's really an unknown uh, parameter for even for, the, for Jupiter right now. So we're going to need these three ingredients in our experiments, and we're also going to need to fulfill some dynamical constraints to be in the good regime for planetary applications. So, of course, we need the Ekman number to be vanishing because we want the friction to be as small as possible. We want the Reynolds number to be uh, very high because we want the flow to be turbulent. We want the Rosby number to remain small because we want the flow to be um, to be rotationally constrained, to be quasi geostrophic And finally, we want the zonostrophic index, our beta, to be large, meaning that we want the scale of the jets to be large compared to the transitional scale. And these constraints are uh, kind of hard to fulfill, whether in uh, experiments or even in, in uh, numerical simulations. And that's why we're still far away from uh, being in the, in the gas giants regimes. So to illustrate this, I've plotted here uh, in the Reynolds number, Ekman, and Zonostrophy Index, Reynolds number space. I've added uh, the gas giants and the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. And uh, with these diagrams, I just wanted to say that you notice that the gas giants are really in more extreme regimes compared to Earth uh, fluid layers. And furthermore, you see that the Zonostrophy Index of the gas giants is much higher than the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. And the consequence of that is basically that in the oceans, the zonal jets are going to be weak and meandering and kind of difficult to see uh, instantaneously. Whereas on the gas giants, the jets are very strong and they, they dominate the flow energetically. They contain up to 90% of the, of the total kinetic energy at the, at the cloud level. So basically this donostrophic index is going to quantify the, let's say the quality of the, and the strength of this uh, zonation. So for reference, I've added on this plot uh, latest 3D direct numerical simulations and a, a 2D one, quasi geostrophic numerical simulations. And the black dots here represent uh, previous experimental studies that I found, uh, that I tried to, to recap from the literature. And what I wanted to say here is that most of these previous experiments were able to retrieve zonal circulations, but usually they are closer to the oceanic regime with weak and meandering jets. And our goal is to try to reach the gas giants regime. And so the experiment that I'm going to describe is a new version that we built during my PhD of uh, the experiments that was built uh, during Simon Cabin postdoc. And we are able to reach uh, more extreme regimes, higher zonostrophy index, which are closer to, to gas giants. Okay, so now I'm going to quickly describe this, um, this ex the associated experimental setup. So uh, we're using a cylindrical tank, which is one meter in diameter, 1.6 meter high. It's filled with 600 liters of water and it rotates at 75 revolutions per minute, so more than a, more than a revolution per second. And because of this very fast rotation, the free surface of the water is going to become paraboloidal uh, because of the, the centrifugal force. And so this is interesting for us because then the fluid height, H, is going to increase with radius. And thus, we're going to have a, naturally a topographic beta effect. Uh, then I want to mention that we designed the bottom plate of this experiment such that the beta effect, in, in fact, is uniform across the domain. Um, so we have rotation, beta effect, and finally, we are going to force the small-scale motions in this experiment 
by circulating the tank's water through this bottom plate, which I represented here. So the forcing pattern is the following on the right. We have um, 128 inlets and outlets, which are distributed on a polar array. We have six rings, and we have as much inlets as outlets on each ring. And each ring is, is going to be controlled independently by a submersible pump. And uh, the important point here is that if you zonally average this forcing, it is zero by construction. So we do not directly accelerate any zonal circulation in, the, in, this, uh, in this fluid lane. Um, okay. And in terms of uh, visualization, we're again going to use particle image velocimetry by uh, following particles motion on a horizontal plane uh, in, the, in the fluid, in the water. Um, okay, so let's illustrate this a little bit now. Uh, here on the left, you have the experiment at rest. You can see the, very, the, the, the cylindrical tank, the deep fluid layer, the laser on the side, all the devices are attached uh, at the top of the experiment. And inside of this fluid layer, we have this uh, bottom plate. You can see the curved uh, shape that I mentioned earlier to have a, to have a homogeneous beta effect. And uh, if you turn it upside down, you see all the hoses and the submersible pumps placed above, which are used to, to circulate the tank's water through the bottom plate. And finally, here, I'm going to get the sound. On the left, you have a movie of the experiments once it is in solid body rotation at 75 RPM. So you see here the very deep uh, paraboloidal free surface that develops after once we are in solid body rotation. Okay, so that's it for the presentation of the of the experimental setup. Now I'm going to show you some some results that we we obtained with this setup. So the first movie that I want to show you is just a qualitative movie that shows the motion of the particles uh, 15 minutes after the forcing uh, was turned down. So once we have reached a, a quasi steady state, and uh, it's accelerated 40 times compared to, to real time. So I don't know if the movies play well, but if it does, you should see that uh, some zonal circulation develops in the, in the system with a clockwise or an anti-clockwise uh, motion uh, being, being observed in the, in the flow. So we are able with this experiment to reproduce uh, zonal circulations, instantaneous zonal jets. And uh, that's the first result, but our surprise was also that uh, we identified different regimes of zonal, of turbulent zonal jets. So now I'm going to, to illustrate these two regimes. So on the left, I'm going to illustrate the first regime, regime one, which is obtained at low forcing amplitude. And to illustrate it, I'm going to show a movie of the azimuthal component of the velocity accelerated 50 times. And this time the movie starts from, from scratch when we turn on the forcing. So on this movie, you see that uh, once the turning is, the forcing is turned down, we have a fast development of six or around six narrow prograde and retrograde jets that occupy the whole uh, experimental domain. So this is what I'm going to call regime one in the following of the talk. And uh, if I do the same experiment, but at a much higher forcing amplitude, we're going to obtain a regime two, the second regime, where uh, you can see that in this second regime, we start with the first regime, but eventually the jets are going to migrate and merge and we have, in the end, a totally new uh, steady state, statistically steady state, where we have less per grade jets, which are also broader and more intense in that second regime. So regime one on the left, regime two on the right. Um, now I wanted to illustrate these two regimes with a space-time diagram. So here I'm going to show the zonal flow profile as a function of time. 
in uh, rotation time units. And you can see in regime one that uh, the zonal flow equilibrates quite quickly and is very steady after that through time. Now, if I plot the same space-time diagrams for regime two, you see that we start in this first regime, regime one. Then we have quite a long transient with uh, drifting and merging. And we have then at the end, a new statistically steady state that I described that you saw earlier on the, on the move. So uh, again, also I want to stress out that the color scale are different on these two, on these two space time diagrams. And finally, uh, here on the right, I plot the evolution of the kinetic energy as a function of time. Uh, the purple line is the total kinetic energy and the red line is the kinetic energy in the zonal flow only. And I just wanted to say that in the first regime, the zonal flow only contains a moderate fraction of the total kinetic energy. Whereas when we jump to the second regime, the zonal flow contains a large fraction of the total kinetic energy. In that particular case, it contains about half the total kinetic energy. So these are really two different dynamical regimes. And we argue that the second regime is the one that is going to be relevant to gas giant's applications. So of course, uh, the next step is to try to understand, to characterize better the transition between these two regimes and to understand, to try to model how this transition is triggered uh, physically. So to answer the first question, we performed some hysteresis experiments, meaning that uh, for a given experiment, I changed the forcing amplitude step-by-step step, and I measured on the y-axis the corresponding zonal flow amplitude. So here, the red curve uh, represents uh, the results for experiments where I increase the forcing amplitude step by step. You see a transition between regime one and regime two. And then I did the same experiment, but by decreasing the forcing amplitude. So again, you see a transition between regime two and regime one. But what you can see is that this transition occurs at a smaller forcing amplitude compared to the case when we increase. So in fact, we have identified a hysteresis loop, a hysteresis cycle. And uh, this means that the shaded area, this forcing range is a bistable range where you can whether obtain regime two or regime one, depending on the history of your system. So that's a, a bistable system. Um, so in terms of the qualitatively describing the transition, this hysteresis means that the transition is going to be abrupt. It's going to be a subcritical transition. Um, okay, so that's the first question. The second question was, can we model this transition physically? So I'm going to uh, be rather fast on the model, but basically we built a quasi geostrophic model of the experiment. So we derived uh, a bidimensional description of the experiment by incor incorporated uh, important 3D effects. And I'm also going to work in a local Cartesian framework, forgetting about the, the polar uh, system. Um, so in this local Cartesian framework, you can decompose the velocity fields into a zonal of rage plus a fluctuation. So the zonal flow is going to be capital U. And you can derive by zonal leveraging the Navier-Stokes equations, you're going to end up with the uh, equation for the evolution of the zonal flow. And you can show that the zonal flow is accelerated by uh, the Reynolds stresses divergence, this term. And we're going to model in the following the dissipation of the zonal flow by a linear friction, which would represent Ekman pumping at the, at the bottom of the tank. So if we want to understand the transition, we need to model the Reynolds stresses divergence, which I'm going to call R, capital R, in the, in the following. So first uh, thing I wanted to show is uh, what happens at the very beginning of an experiment just above a uh, given forcing ring. So here I represent the azimuthal and uh, radial component of the velocity at the very beginning of an experiment, just when we turn on the forcing. And what you see is that we retrieve the forcing inlets and outlets, which are the different patterns that you can see. However, you can also see that there is a westward deformation of this pattern. 
And in fact, this corresponds to the radiation of Rossby waves due to our forcing, uh, due to our forcing when it's turned on, it radiates Rossby waves which propagate towards the negative X direction. And most uh, interestingly, most importantly, if you compute the Reynolds stresses divergence associated with those waves, well, you can show that at the latitude where the waves are emitted, you're going to accelerate a prograde jet and you're going to, uh, to accelerate a retrograde jet uh, far from the emission latitude. So in the end, if I go back now to the global uh, geometry, what happens in the regime one is that each forcing ring uh, radiates some Rossby waves. These waves accelerate a prograde jet uh, above each forcing ring. And in between each forcing ring, we have a retrograde flow. And that's exactly what we observed experimentally in regime one. So um, that's the picture for regime one. Now it doesn't explain what uh, happens in regime two. What we have, why, we, why do we have a transition in regime two? So to understand the transition to regime two, we need to consider the fact that there is a background zonal flow superposed to the radiation of those Rossby waves. So here, uh, the plot on the bottom left represents the Reynolds stresses divergence as a function of the zonal flow amplitude. And uh, so this is uh, numerical uh, results when we, we solve for the, for the linear uh, equations. And the case that I mentioned earlier was the case without a zonal flow, so capital U is equal to zero. In that case, the waves, the Rossby waves are just going to propagate westward. And then once they dissipate and deposit their momentum, they're going to accelerate some zonal flow, as I mentioned uh, before. Now imagine that you reach a zonal flow velocity, U, which is equal to exactly the opposite of the phase speed of those Rossby waves then uh, those waves are going to become stationary, face lock with the forcing and be able to amplify through time. So basically these Rossby waves can become linearly resonant with the forcing because they are advected, Doppler shifted by the, by the zonal flow. So the mechanism that I'm uh, explaining here is just linear resonance. And in fact, you can describe this, uh, you, you can parameterize this, uh, you can describe this Reynolds stresses divergence as a Lorentzian as a function of U, the zonal flow. And this Lorentzian is parameterized by some amplitude RM, which materializes the forcing amplitude, gamma, which quantifies the dissipation of the Rossby waves, and uh, of course, the ratio U over C. So we have this linear resonance that can occur in the system. Now we're going to try to see if it can explain the transition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, to plug this Lorentzian into the zonal flow evolution equation. So that's the zonal flow evolution equation. Again, R of U is the Lorentzian. And uh, we're going to seek the stationary solutions of these uh, equations, the fixed point of this, uh, of this dynamical system. So in the following, the yellow curve is going to be the Lorentzian, the forcing, the acceleration of the zonal flow. And I'm going to add a blue line, which is going to represent the friction, the linear friction, um, which dissipates the zonal flow. And so the fixed points are going to be the, the points where the two curves intersect. Uh, so we are going to have three possible configurations that I sum up on this uh, diagram. Here I plot the amplitude of the stationary solutions of the fixed point as a function of the forcing amplitude Rm. First configuration, if the forcing amplitude is small, Rm is small, the, for, the friction curve intersects the Lorentzian at only a small zonal flow amplitude. And this is going to correspond to regime one, which would then be a sub-resonant solution, sub-resonant regime. Then if the forcing amplitude is sufficient, sufficiently large, I'm going to have another configuration where, again, I have only one possible solution, but which is super resonant, and this would correspond to regime two. And in between, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this range, I'm, I'm going to have three intersection points between the friction and the Lorentzian knowing that the second uh, fixed point is an unstable fixed point, I'm going to be left with U1 and U3, 
And so this would correspond to the bistability. So we have come up with a, a physical mechanism to, to explain the bistability and the, and the transition that we see. Now, the last step is to try to, com to compare uh, quantitatively this model with uh, our experimental measurements. And uh, what we can do is, for instance, look at the zonal flow amplitude at the transition points, S1 and S2. And um, if we do this, we obtain the dashed curve in this, uh, in this hysteresis diagram, meaning that we quantitatively predict the correct amplitude for the zonal flow when the, when the transition occurs in the, in the experiment. So to sum up, um, the transition that we identified is abrupt, it's associated with bistability, and it's triggered by a Rosby wave a mean flow resonance. And so to finish uh, this talk, I wanted to briefly give uh, some implications at a planetary scale for this, for this transition. Um, so the strict mechanism of wave jet resonance was uh, developed initially by Charney and Devoir in 1979 to account for the transition between blocked and zonal uh, configuration for the jet stream in Earth's atmosphere. So that's the first kind of application that you can think about. Second application was recently uh, underlined by uh, Corentin Herbert, uh, and he involves, he, he, he uses this kind of um, uh, wave jet resonance to explain the transition to super rotation in, uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, I wanted to go a little bit further and try to see if we can uh, make uh, what it would imply for eddy driven jets in oceans or in, uh, in uh, gas giants. So to do so, I'm going to look at uh, the phase speed of Rosby waves. So the, these are just very simple, uh, simple velocity comparisons. And uh, if those Rosby waves are still going westward, even after their advection by the zonal flow, it means that we are in regime one, sub-resonant regime. Whereas if they are going eastward, it means that we're in regime two in the super-resonant regime. So I did a first uh, very simple, uh, comparison uh, for the, the Earth ocean. So here you have um, the zonal uh, propagation speed of uh, 80s in the ocean, uh, derived by uh, Clocker and collaborators. And um, you can see that in the vast majority of, these of the ocean, the phase speed is uh, westward, even after the Doppler shift. So this would mean that we would be in regime one. Whereas uh, maybe in the Antarctic circumpolar currents, we have an eastward phase speed, meaning that we could be in the second uh, super resonant regime. Uh, now, if we do an application for the gas giants, um, I used uh, these measurements of hotspots displacements by Arrighi and collaborators. And they say that these hotspots could correspond to Rosby waves uh, propagating again eastward uh, even after the Doppler shift, meaning that the corresponding zonal jet would be a super resonant jet. And for Saturn, we have the same conclusion using the north ribbon displacement, which is a feature located at 42 degrees north. This uh, displacement of the north ribbon could correspond to uh, Rosby waves with, again, an eastward uh, Doppler shifted phase speed, which would correspond to a super resonant jet. So, of course, these applications are just very simple. I just did uh, velocity comparisons. It would need a much more work to uh, address if the resonance is still relevant with planetary-like uh, forcing, like thermal forcing or something like that. Okay, I see that I'm completely out of time, so I'm going to skip this part totally and uh, briefly jump to uh, my conclusion. So basically the big picture is that um, the vortices that we see in Jupiter's atmosphere are uh, supposedly shallow structures uh, of about 100 kilometers uh, deep, uh, whereas the jets are uh, deeper structures. I've presented a setup where we can model extreme regimes of zonal jets. And I want to underline that the Rosby waves play a key role in um, terms of nonlinear interaction with the zonal flow. Uh, 
And the last part that I uh, just skipped was to show that the second regime is consistent with the zonostropic turbulence regime relevant to gas giants, and that we performed additional quasi geostrophic simulations to, to elaborate on, on it. And I'm going to skip all that future work and just say that, of course, the most interesting uh, future uh, studies to perform would be to try to couple um, basically what I showed in the first part, the fact that we have shallow vertices in a stratified weather layer and what's happening deeper, uh, where I showed barotropic zonal jets. So it would, be, it would be really nice to be able to perform studies where we can couple a deep barotropic dynamics with the shallow baroclinic dynamics, which occurs in the, in the weather layer of Jupiter. And with that, I thank you very much. Sorry for the time, this excess of time, and I'd be glad to answer any, any question that you can have. Thank you so much, Daphne. That was really fascinating. Um, um, we are exactly at where we want to be for our allotted time. So I think this is a great time to stop the official talk, say thank you, and thank all the guests who came. And uh, if you'd like to stick around, we'll chat informally.